If you're listening to this podcast, it means you're ready, no more than ready, to have a major breakthrough in your business. You're hungry for change and you're hungry for growth, and that's why you're feeding your mind right now with all this valuable information. But to drive those changes, to be really smart about what you're doing and to make the right choices before you take massive action, you need help from someone who's been there, someone who's gonna coach you through it, even just someone to get you started on your journey. That's why Tony Robbins is offering a free one-to-one business strategy session from one of his top business coaches, a $600 value, completely free, no strings attached. That's right. If you're listening right now, you can go to TonyRobbins.com slash CEO and sign up for a free session with a member of Tony's team who's helped business owners like yourself overcome their obstacles and set them on the path to success. Hey everyone, it's Anna, Editorial Director of Robbins Research International. Welcome to the Tony Robbins Podcast. Last fall, eight winners of Shopify's Build a Bigger Business competition were flown to Tony's Fiji resort, Namale, for both group and one-on-one coaching sessions with him. One entrepreneur that Tony personally selected from the entrance was Michelle Cordero Grant, the founder of Lively, a brand that is fusing athleisure and lingerie to bring a sense of emotional inclusiveness that she believes is lacking in the current market. Here's a look at her one-on-one session with Tony. I'm Michelle Cordero Grant, founder and CEO of Lively. What we sell are bras and undies and swimwear today, Um, but adjacency products will be coming tomorrow. I'm a big believer in rip open the plan that you're gonna do, but I always have that backup plan. We started with an amazing conversation, talking through the business, talking through the strategy, me as a leader and so forth. I have zero question about your ability to succeed, because if if you take away all the skills and you have that much drive and hunger, you'll figure it out. It was nice that he kind of took a moment to acknowledge that you're gonna do this no matter what, but it's really how you do this that's gonna be game changing in your personal life. My only piece for you is taking care of you so that this journey, you don't look back and have regrets, right? right? And the place that you have regret will probably not be the business, it will be in your personal life. His approach is personal and it's tailored, um, which I think is amazing. I think that's why he's so effective um, because he customizes to whoever he's interacting with. I have no question she can succeed in business. My concern was I could feel that below that there is this lack of fulfillment and enjoyment even though she's busting her tail. And my goal in life is not only help people achieve more, my goal is helping people have life on their terms. Tell me what what are you gonna go back with and tell me what questions you might have or how I might be able to help. Quite frankly, when I started the week, I thought I was gonna be asking him more for business advice. But as I kind of went through the course of the journey, it changed because I really embraced what he says about it being 80% psychology and 20% you know, operations. And so I started to lean into that. Imagine there's a set of archetypes. Okay. Um, a warrior archetype, yeah. which clearly you have it within you. <laughs> I'm gonna broke through this, I'm gonna make this thing happen, right? Uh, but the warrior is the one that will go do battle. The warrior is fearless. The warrior will just push through. Yeah. I'm gonna ask you, if, stand up with me just for a moment. Sure told me to stand up. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. Where are we going? What are we doing? Do you relate to the warrior in you? Yeah, of If course. you had to instinctively say, where is the warrior in me? Touch that part of your body, wherever that, oh, right here. Okay, good. The warrior says, Michelle, all you need to do now, all you need to remember, all you need to do to go to the next level is, and give me the first response to say, the warrior says, Michelle. The warrior says, Michelle, all I need to do to get to the next level is focus. She's a very independent sort. So instead of me giving the advice, I wanted her to give the advice to her. Let's try something different. There's a magician. The magician can see the strategy nobody else sees. Right. The magician has fun with stuff that stresses out the warrior. Feel the quality of the magician. What's the quality of emotion different than the warrior? I'm curious. Can you feel the difference? Oh. <laughs> yes. And that's the piece you're missing right now. I felt fortunate at the time because I knew that he was going to be sharing with me a gift um, that he he gives to select people. And for him to take the time to go there with me, um, made me feel really, um, really blessed. The lover in you. Yeah. Where's the lover? Touch where the lover is. Oh. Okay, good. And the, lover, <laughs> and the lover is what you really are. Yeah. You're driven by love. Even your customers, you're driven by love. It's very obvious. Some people say that. Yeah. You really are that. It's where you get your energy. It isn't just about business, it's about love. She loves her clients. She wants to see them have a beautiful life. And she's so busy running around doing everything that she kind of lost that connection. So I want to bring that connection back. As powerful as this woman is here, and I respect her immensely, this woman with tears (laughs) in her, she's the one who can penetrate anyone. Thank you. And and you're being very vulnerable right now, but you're being connected to yourself. Yeah. And that feeling, that's what I want for you on this journey. Yeah. I've done this for 40 years with, you know, 
tens of millions of people from 100 countries, so at this point I could be an idiot. <laughs> I have to be able to notice there are patterns that make people angry or sad or frustrated. There are patterns that make people passionate or grateful or excited. And when you know what those patterns are and you see what they are, you know what to do to help people just because I have, you know, I got a lifetime's worth of experience. You don't have to give up any of that drive yeah. for you to have the quality of life you deserve. Thank you. And your family deserves. Thank you. <laughs> I'll see you soon. Thank you. Now today, Michelle is joining us on the podcast to talk about her experience with Tony and the key insights that she took from this session and put to work in her business. We also talk about what it's been like to build a lively brand. We dive into how they've leveraged social media, curated an extraordinary customer experience, and created a company ethos that serves as their North Star when it comes to their most important business decisions. We also learn just how Michelle intends to spread her message of body positivity and community all while bringing her customers a brand that makes them look, feel, and live confidently. So, um, Michelle, welcome to the podcast. We're so excited to have you here. And, um, you know, I'm not going to lie. The reason I really wanted you to share your story with our audience is because you were part of this uh, Shopify contest that uh, Tony did um, in partnership with Shopify, where the winners um, got to go to Fiji and have some one-on-one -on -one time with him and a few other um, sort of strategic uh, business you know, counselors. Um, and I'd love to know sort of how you, how that came to be. Um, how did you enter and, and what was your experience like throughout the contest? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, it just kind of felt meant to be for me. I started my company in April of 2016, built my um, direct to consumer business on Shopify with the lowest plan for $199 a month. Mm -hmm. And we were so fortunate that we were focused on community. Um, we grew organically really quickly. And about a year later in March um, 2017 or 2016, excuse me, um, I had just had my son. So after launching Lively, two months later, I found out I was pregnant with my second child. And six days after having him, you know, things just felt really loose in our business. You know, we were moving warehouses, our customer service was going through the roof. And I just felt the need for, to ask for help. Yeah. And out of nowhere, I get this email in my inbox from Shopify that was like, hey, we have a competition about building a bigger business. And wouldn't it be amazing to be mentored by Tony Robbins and, you know, this incredible panel of other entrepreneurs um, and mentors and so forth. And I'm like, well, this is, like I said, meant to be. Yep. And I applied at that moment and um, kind of went back to focusing on the business and the team and had this, you know, thing in the back of my mind, just what if, what if, never did I really think we would win. We were 15 months old mm -hmm. um, and got a call in August. Wow. So you were 15 months old. What was your journey like sort of from, you know, fruition to the point where you uh, started you know, working with, for, in the Shopify contest. Yeah. So, um, I left my, I left my quote unquote job. Um, <laughs> Why do you August. say that? <laughs> uh, you know, cause everyone has their, their full-time stable structured job sure. where for, for the most part, people don't love and live, um, their passion the way that I, I had been. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I got to the place in my life where uh, I no longer loved, um, going to work as much as I used to. So I, I always say to people, you know, I have always been that girl that skipped to work or just mm -hmm. was, you know, annoyingly smiling on the subway at yep. 8 30 in the morning. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and so I always felt extremely grateful for that. Um, but after I was at Victoria's Secret for some time, that smile started to dwindle and I said, you know, something needs to change. Um, and so I, I moved over to a startup. I worked there for three years and finally I said, all right, it's time. You know, I need to do, um, you know, what I, I was set out to do. I always felt like there was this, um, this journey I was supposed to be on. So I said, YOLO, like let's, the time is now. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so I started in August of 2015. I, I found investors and a supply chain that could help me. And I came to an office with three blank walls and glass and said, all right, it's official. I'm starting this company. And it was me. <laughs> and was, okay. <laughs> you, yourself and you. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I'm like, step one, how to start a company. One, did you Google it? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's funny. I, I used a lot of tactics that Tony actually teaches, one being, you know, understand your blind spots. And, yeah. you know, at the time I called it my vulnerabilities. Like, where was I most fearful? Um, and I made a list of, of areas that I was most fearful and said, okay, um, customer service, uh, digital marketing, fulfillment, and started attacking that list and saying, all right, now who knows these areas best? Who are the experts? And, you know, hustled my way on LinkedIn and my network and so forth and just said, what's your favorite cup of coffee? Where do you like to work out? You know, how can I have 15 minutes of your time to convince you that you need to such a good stalker? I'm so impressed. (laughs) Yeah. Well, Um, some people call it stalking. Other people just call it hustle, you know, and that's I I do think that is um, a characteristic of really successful entrepreneurs like they have that. Yeah, it's just that drive. Right. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I didn't realize how crazy it probably came across to those. (laughs) Well, you were blinded by passion, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, once I had that foundation of, of, of support, I was able to sit down and say, all right, let's build this brand. Um, and so the second thing I did was this brand needs to physically exist. And so I have a wall in my office and it's the visual articulation of what I wanted my brand to be. Because the way that I, I approached it was that if I was going to build a team around this brand, quote unquote, X, people needed to understand it. And I couldn't just verbally share it. I needed to visually share it. Mm. And and so I would kind of start to recruit people by bringing them to this office that I kind of decked out and made seem like this big company so that they could come in and perform as if it was a big company. Um, and that's kind of how we set out. We built a vision board. We started building a mini, mini team. There was three of us. We set rules and goals and values um, and started to build the Lively Ethos. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned that you knew your blind spots. And so you went out and you hustled and you found people to help you there. Um, and then there were, pro- there were areas that you felt really confident in. Is that because those were the areas that you, that your career had essentially trained you for? Like, was that because you had experience in them? Exactly. Mm. Yeah. I um, had been super fortunate that I, I grew up in retail. Um, I worked for Federated, creating private brands for uh, Macy's and Bloomingdale's, mm-hmm. VF Corporation with national brands like Nautica and Kipling, and and then really found my passion at Victoria's Secret, where I was focused on direct-to-consumer conversations on a category that I, I just love. Yep. So is that why you decided to stick with that category? Because you felt really confident in your sort of domain knowledge and then also still passionate it really about the, the product and, and what you're providing people? Yeah, it was a combination of both. It was a category that I just truly loved mm-hmm. because it was, it's kind of this thing that um, women get to share, but they've never really celebrated. So I just saw such a unique opportunity and how do we create a, how do we shift a category from something that's like dated, awkward and overlooked mm-hmm. to something that's celebrated and, um, and just really enjoyed. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, every woman shopping for bras for the first time is terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying, right? You go into it, like you said, outdated. You go into department stores and like older woman, you know, tries to fit, you know, measure you. And it's always really uncomfortable and cold. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, making that transition into like a more modern era where, you know, we we live in an on-demand society now, right? Like you can go on Amazon and order whatever you'd like. And then this whole concept as well that Warby Parker really pioneered um, was this, you know, sort of bespoke um, but be delivered to you. And so you've moved really seamlessly into that category. But what's really fascinating is it's not just about the product. Like you said, you guys have an ethos. And mm-hmm. I love that shift that you made. You said, you know, Victoria's Secret has this mindset of um, how do I feel when a man looks at me versus the lively ethos, which is how do I look when I'm feeling confident, comfortable, and ready to take on the day. So could you explain a little bit about how you created this ethos? And, you know, in in some ways, it seems like it was the opposite of where you came from. So it's, you know, it seemed like a very natural shift, but it's also very challenging. So what was your approach going into that? Sure. Yeah, it, it really came from um, what I was experiencing in life. And, and that, like I said, that skipping to work kind of feeling where I, I was living a very, and still am, a passionate filled um, lifestyle where my job is um, so fulfilling and rewarding. And I was, you know, working in these corporations where I kept looking around and just seeing people not sharing that same type of lifestyle and friends and family constantly complaining about their jobs and so forth. And I'm like, well, what if I could create a brand within this category that not just shifted the mentality of the category, but also started to spread an ethos and a conversation about 
Life is about choices. So you can choose to live a passionate, fulfilling life. You can choose to take your dreams and make them your goals. You can choose all of these things. It's all, it's all about just having the courage, the confidence, and potentially the support um, around you to get it done. Um, and so I made that decision in 2012 where I was going to leave Victoria's Secret. I was going to create this this community and this platform to really encourage um, women um, to start to not just participate in what they love, because I was participating at Victoria's Secret, but to start to lead. Mm-hmm. Um, and by leading, I could, I could own the conversation. I could create the dialogue and the story versus at Victoria's Secret. I was participating in the dialogue and the story of what Les Wexner wanted to see in the lingerie area, which is totally valid from his perspective, right? He created a brand which was about buying beautiful lingerie for his wife Mm -hmm. um, so that he could see her in her most sexy element. And that was, um, you know, the angel, the fantasy and the push up. So anywhere I went in the world, a hundred different languages, you said Victoria's Secret, they heard angel fantasy push up. Yeah. And so I wanted to change that to my own conversation where if women are talking about bras and undies, what if they talked about inner uniqueness, individuality, confidence, and that really channeled individual um, opportunity to live your best self, which at the end of the day will make you ultimately sexy. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, so I'm really fascinated about how you started with this ethos and you you basically did a social media launch before anything else. <laughs> what prompted that decision and how did you, you know, identify the people that you knew you wanted to be part of this movement? Yeah, um, you know, it started with my um, my vision of I grew up loving fashion because I love the idea of brand, right? And mm-hmm. brands, their IP is not, you know, you think about Ralph Lauren, the IP in the, in the polo was not the polo shirt. It was how that horse made people feel when they mm-hmm. put it on, Yep. right? Mm-hmm. And I just love that you could inspire people that way. Um, but over the years, I saw that really starting to wane and get diluted with markdowns and sales and all these different things. So I said, what if we brought the power of brand back, but instead of talking at customers the way brands used to, what if we... T- we built this um, brand with a community. We were an open brand. So it wasn't us deciding, okay, we're gonna create Lively and this is what it's gonna say and this is the photo shoot and this is the product. What if we said, we're gonna create Lively and we want you to help us do that. Help us choose the imagery, help us create um, the the dialogue and so forth. And that's why we started on social, to be honest. Mm. We said, let's actually- Crowd, Crowdsource your brand. So people exactly. crowdsource funding. Why wouldn't you harvest ideas from the community before you even get started? That's super interesting. Exactly, exactly. So why wait to launch your brand and see if people love it? Yep. Instead, build it with them and you know they'll love it. Yep. Um, so in uh, the spring of um, 2016, a couple months before we launched, we started doing just that. We we started holding focus groups and sharing with people like, hey, here's our product. What do you think? Like, here's the imagery and some of the words we're using. Like, do you respond to this? What do you love? What, what don't you? Like, how do you feel about this conversation we're, we're having? Mm. And um, thankfully, it was really well received, but they helped us really focus it um, and, and make it more and more authentic as we went through that process. And then we, um, we went to Instagram and we started posting images and those taglines that we worked with our, um, you know, focus groups on, and community on creating. And instantly people started direct messaging us. I remember the first girl was a girl named Taylor Tippett. She was a flight attendant from Chicago and she saw our, our first post and she's like, how can I help? Like, this is amazing. Yeah. And we're like, what do you mean? And she's like, I, I want to be a, a part of this brand. I'm like, all right, perfect. And so we, we started to create rules. We said, we will only share imagery and taglines that represent our ethos. We will not tell anybody the price of our product. Mm -hmm. We will not push the features of our product. We will only stand for the movement first and foremost. And we started to build, um, we had about a hundred ambassadors that we built a network of focusing honestly, purposefully in the middle of the country, because we didn't want to just focus on New York and California. We wanted to make sure this brand was accessible Mm -hmm. to most geographically. And um, that's rare, and by there, the way, that's very rare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we were looking at women's um, profiles, not for the number of followers they had, but for what their uh, their feed had in terms of content. Were they living a fulfilling life? Did they demonstrate that they were um, truly passionate about something, whether it was food or art or, or professionalism, whatever it was? Are they passionate people? And, and that's how we curated the crew. 
Yeah. And it's interesting because a lot of people think of Instagram <clears throat> as being a superficial medium. But what I've noticed is that over the past few years in particular, um, it actually fits in very well to one of Tony's famous quotes, which is um, <clears throat> meaning equals emotion and emotion equals life. So there are some really fascinating artistic things going on on Instagram that does seem to carry more meaning. Um, and then that meaning carries over into an emotion. And when you're talking about building a brand, what is a brand? Your point about, you know, Ralph Lauren, it's the emotion that you feel about it. Mm -hmm. And that's ethereal. And that's something that's long lasting as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, I love that you took that approach. Now, is this the kind of approach, though, that you would recommend to other people? Absolutely. Mm. You know, because from a business standpoint, and, and we've held these rules to this day, right? So we, we still do not acquire customers based on price first, even though our, our product has an incredible value. Mm -hmm. um, we still at the top of our marketing funnel focus on ethos. And because of that, our customer is just beyond amazing. Her lifetime value, her repeat rate, her word of mouth, all of it is just beautiful, including the diversity of it. So you look at our our household income, it's a rainbow. It, it doesn't matter if you make 50000 mm. or 500000 It doesn't matter if you live in Minnesota or on the Upper East Side. It doesn't matter if you're 18 years old or 55 years old. We market to a mindset and it gives our business so much strength. Well, and that gives you, you scope and scale also, right? I mean, then you're not limiting yourself to certain demographics or geographical profiles. Exactly. And you're not tied to, you're not in a product race either, right? So yeah. whether it's wearables or whatever, you're not trying to beat your, your last um, best product per se. You're creating um, an ethos and a brand that can go in so many different avenues. It doesn't matter if we're selling bras or if we're having concerts. That lively feeling and that inspiration um, is long lasting. Yep. Apple does the same thing. I think Apple could pivot into almost any industry and it would still succeed. Right. Yeah. Um, so I like that you, you know, you're talking about how not, you did, purposely did not limit yourself from the very beginning. Um, one thing that you've done that I think completely sets you apart from the competition is this broad size range. So, you, mm -hmm. so you've got 50 different styles, 26 sizes. You're also sort of blending the lines between lingerie, active, swimwear. Um, and I, I mean, I'm a customer <laughs> and I get your emails <laughs> you. and I'm like, continuously amazed at how the offerings continue to broaden um, but the quality seems to remain the same is that does that have to do with your supply chain or is that do you have the ability to broaden your range so quickly be because of the way that you've set up your operations sure yeah no it's um one of our clear competitive advantages is our supply chain before I started the company, I said, the only way that I can do this is if I lock down supply chain. Um, and not only did I lock down an amazing supply chain, they were actually my first investors pre-launch. Oh, perfect. Be, yeah. It's like a dream I mean, come true. Lottery. <laughs> yeah, they're lotto. literally invested. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And it was to the point where when we started developing our product, I purposefully did not bring on anybody that was previously in the lingerie space because I wanted to make sure that we did things differently. Instead, I brought in um, my creative partner, Sarah, um, who came from an active and lounge background and said to her, like, forget everything we know. Let's just buy and um, curate all the products that we're living in. And so she was obviously wearing a lot of active and sports mm, bras. Yoga pants. Yep. <laughs> and, and swimwear I was wearing as bras because yep. I was so proud for them to show mm -hmm. and we started literally cutting the waistbands off yoga pants and stapling them to like lace bralettes that's just genius because <laughs> it's true the, the waistbands on yoga pants are just too thick and the <laughs> and the bands on bras are way too thin so wow that's literally solving a problem <laughs> totally and we were just being you know creative and weird and having yeah. fun and when we took this to our, our manufacturers who again were our investors were like interesting like so different are you sure and we're like yes let's just try and they said okay so what we're going to do is actually build a factory dedicated towards creating this product because one it's unique two we know that quality control is beyond um of the utmost importance to you and three we want to give you that read and react um, ability that you have demonstrated is so important. So uh, we were able to actually launch with 22 sizes from day one, which is oh, crazy. Wow, that's insane. When I was doing the buy, one of those, three of these. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
Sarah. And, um, you know, and they knew that and we, we hoped that we were going to sell out, but still be able to take orders. And luckily that came to fruition. We sold out of our product in two weeks, but we still took orders and we we're able to backfill them within, you know, 14 to 30 days. Yep. Is that also how you keep consistent and, and very low, to be honest, like pricing? It's very reasonable. Um, is that how you do that as well? Or was that a uh, sort of strategic decision from the get-go to make everything even across the board? And I think also you have to explain to people who aren't lively customers how you guys do pricing. Because um, entrepreneurs, that's one of the first questions questions they ask is like, I don't know how to do pricing. How do I, how do I, you know, how do I do this? Yeah. Yeah. So we, um, we set out our goal, which was about simplicity. And I, I kind of said from the beginning, I want all of our bras to be the same price. I don't care what size, what shape, how intricate the style is. I mm-hmm. want for the consumer not to have that as a, um, a, you know, a way for them to choose between styles. Yeah. Um, and so, and so we set that goal and we said, okay. And then at the same time, we want to make sure that we have a margin in place in which we could afford world-class customer service, gorgeous packaging, like beyond, you mm-hmm. know, like that Metaporte experience and all of these things, because it's not just about how the product makes you feel. It's about the experience of discovering the brand, receiving the product and telling about, you know, sharing it with your friends. Yep. And so um, to your question about about price, we price all of our bras for $35, doesn't matter um, what it is. And then if you buy two, it's 55. And if you buy three, it's 75. Because having lived in this category, I know that when women buy bras, they want to get it done. And so they yeah. usually buy anywhere. A from lot at once. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so from a business standpoint, economically, women on average will buy at least three bras um, from Lively in an experience. And it just makes us, um, it gives us the ability to put in all of those other pieces of the experience back into the customer's hands. Yeah. The nice part too about simplistic pricing is that people's brains are not, we do, we do not have the capacity to make right. the decisions, the sheer volume of decisions that we are expected to make in a day. And if you have to go in and you have to start doing math about, okay, well, is this going to cost this much? And if I buy this, then I'll get two of these. I mean, it's exhausting. No. Um, so that's, it's really great that that's, you know, you're really helping the customer in that sense. Absolutely. The less friction, the better. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, I love that you mentioned your packaging because your packaging is extremely luxurious feeling. It also, you guys um, tend to surprise your customers. And, you know, I noticed I, I got like some cute socks <laughs> in my last package. Awesome. So, you know, and that's really interesting too, because one of the things that Tony talks about at his business mastery event is that when you go to price something, um, you have to make sure you're not undervaluing, right? Mm-hmm. So you figure out the value to the, to the client and you price it accordingly. And a lot of people tend to undercut themselves because they're looking to the right and the left and looking at their competitors and thinking, well, mm-hmm. oh, I have, you know, so they're, they're making decisions based on information that is not direct client. Um, But packaging it in a luxurious way is something that adds value. So that's something that makes people feel special taken care of. So I think you really nailed those three things, right? Broad size range, honest price, luxurious packaging. But then (laughs) you've got this one final thing that you, it's interesting because you mentioned that, that this is something that you did not feel comfortable about in the very beginning, but your customer service so Tony, Tony has this, you know, idea of raving fan clients and, you know, satisfied, you know, people say, I want to satisfy my customer, but satisfied customers will go away as soon as something yeah. better comes along, or maybe it's cheaper, but a right. raving fan client, somebody who really feels passionate about your brand and your product, they will be loyal with you to the end, which is, you know, makes sense. Cause you said you have, you've got a long lifetime value for, uh, for your customers, but that's really easy to say and very hard to do because there's so many customer touch points, and especially right. now with digital media. So how do you even begin to provide this exceptional level of customer service with the lean team that you have and, you know, with this consistency across the board? Sure, sure. Um, you know, it actually started pre-launch. You know, when we were creating that community on Instagram, we also did an email referral campaign, um, which I think you read about. And mm-hmm. in that, we said to, you know, 250 of our friends and family, we said, for every person that you get to submit their email to, um, you know, wherelively.com, you will get a point towards your first purchase. And 
and we had this like pretty little cute dashboard, you know, scale that said, you know, 10 points equals this, 20 points, da da da. But nice. nowhere in the experience did it tell you how much our bra actually cost. Mm-hmm. So we're like, ah, uh, you know, Harry's did this in 2011, they got 100,000 emails, we're hoping to maybe get 5,000 emails a week. Mm -hmm. We released that email on a Friday around two o'clock. By Sunday morning, we had 133,000 emails submitted, 300,000 sessions globally. Wow. Did it crash your servers? Oh, crash. I mean, (laughs) there were, you know, devs in bathroom stalls. Yeah. I mean, it's a good problem to have. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It was bananas. I'm like, wow, our company didn't even launch and we've been hacked. Wow, (laughs) that's amazing. It it was real. And so at that moment, I say to people, that's actually when our our company launched because that's when I turned on customer service. Mm. I said, we owe it to this community to be in touch with them. So we turned on phone, email, and chat immediately. And we were on it 24 hours a day and there was three of us. And and that was when I, I actually learned customer service. I started to hear what people were saying. And it was actually the most valuable um, time period for us as a company because we took notes to everything they said and we used it actually for marketing. We said, why do you like us? Like, what do you love about this? And and those actual customer quotes became our emails and became, you know, Mm. the dialogue that we started the company on. And to this day, we go to Instagram comments and customer service to be proactive to share. Now to your um, you know, actual question, which is how do we have superior customer service? We leaned in hard on it. We just always had more customer service available than we needed. And we yeah. actually look at benchmarks for companies that are not in our um, our bucket in terms of revenue and, and employee count. We look at two buckets ahead and say, we need to be on their level. That's great. I mean, that's that's something that's great advice for any entrepreneur. If there's something you really want to excel at, don't look to your peers. Don't look to the people in your category or in your revenue range. You look ahead. Now, that's Correct. brilliant. Yeah. So it sounds like everything was going really well. Um, when you when you went into this Shopify experience where you were in Fiji and and you know talking to Tim Ferriss and Marie Forleo and and Joe Gebbia and Tony, um, what were some of your pain points going into that? Yeah, um, I think that Tony kind of nailed it (laughs) where he identified what my pain point was. And honestly, like going Mm. into it, I didn't know what it was. I Mm. knew that I knew our company was growing, you know, incredibly fast. I knew our team was growing incredibly fast. And I had this like sense of uneasiness, but I couldn't quite pinpoint what it was. Um, And I and I thought going into Fiji that my um my obstacle or what I really needed to unpack was how did I want to grow my company? You know, did I want to go down the path of every, uh, that typically startups go, which is, you know, you hit a certain threshold. Now you start doing subway campaigns and billboards and so forth. I thought it was like, how do I grow the awareness of my company? Um, But what I actually realized when I was sitting with Tim and and Marie and and Tony specifically was it wasn't about that. It was about my own mental thresholds. Mm. And it was actually more about how do I how do I grow as a leader and as an entrepreneur and how do I stop being in my business and start you know being an owner of my business yeah owner not operator and this is this is the classic thing and I just wish every entrepreneur could understand this and Tony says the biggest chokehold on your business is the psychology of its leader it's a hundred percent. And, and, uh, you know, so he, so I'm super interested in this because he's, I was watching the video and he says to you, you know, I have, old, I have faith in you. Like you're going to do this. There's, there's no doubt in my mind. Like, and I think everybody who's listening right now, they know that clearly you're focused and you have the skill set and you have the passion and the power. So he's like, look, you're going to do this no matter what, but it's how you do it. That's going to be game changing, not professionally, but personally. So right. what, what did he mean by that? Yeah, he, I think he could see on me, you know, this, um, that I was torn, you know, I mm. was, I had, I just had my son at the time he was about, you know, nine months old and I was in Fiji yeah. <laughs> and I was, you know, um, and I had been traveling a lot and he could see that I was so torn about being away from my family and my kids that I was trying to figure out like, how am I going to how am I going to grow this company and do this thing that I love so much while I also spend time with the people that matter most to me? Um, and I realized it was the answer was becoming an owner and not an operator. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the answer was about, you know, 
being dedicated to balance because there is no there's no recipe for balance it's a discipline in my opinion it's you just have to decide that that is the type of lifestyle you're going to live and you live it and he started sharing with me examples of women that currently do it and so forth and he was like look like you don't want to look back and say yeah, I built lively and and it's a huge success, but I missed all of these amazing moments in my children's life. So, yeah, I mean, I I think every woman who has kids who has also, you know, very either has a business or is very passionate about their career. They just probably got goosebumps just now because that is, you just spoke to the deepest fear. (laughs) I think (laughs) of every woman is like, yeah, missing out on your kid's childhood. And the, you know, Tony always says there's no such thing as work-life balance. And when you think about balance, we tend to think about the day to day. We tend to think, oh, am I going to, you know, I need to go to parent teacher conferences, but then I'm going to, you know, I feel guilt. We call it mom guilt, right? So it's, well, I'm missing this afternoon board meeting because I'm going to the dance recital, but if I miss the dance recital, so you're, nobody's happy, right? You're always letting people down. Um, And we get caught up in that day to day and we're so busy, we're so used to being tough and multitasking that we also lose touch with our emotions and our passion and our love for what we're doing and our love for the people that we're around. So ultimately that's where the balance really comes back in is being able to cater to what he called like the lover in you you know you, yeah. got, you got the warrior but then what about the lover so yeah how, how did that impact you and how did you feel after that moment that you had with him sure you know it was I mean the man is so gifted it's amazing because his eyes are so warm where you know physically he's he's a big gentleman oh right? yeah he's a force but- of nature yeah he's, he's a big guy yeah he just captures you, though, in a way that is so um, warm and nurturing. It was such a safe space, I have to say, you know, mm-hmm. in that interview. Mm-hmm. Um, and when he outlined, you know, the the idea of the warrior and so forth and the lover, it, it, it everything just kind of crystallized and became so clear. You know, um, when I found out I was pregnant with Jack, I <laughs> kind of on this journey where I felt like I had to prove to the community that I could do this. You know, mm-hmm. I, I felt like there was a lot of doubt around me. There are like, she just started this company and she's pregnant and she is raising capital and she's building this team and this and this and this, like it's never going to happen. Mm-hmm. And so I was on such an adrenaline rush that I was just doing, doing, doing. I had Jack, I was back at work three weeks later. Mm-hmm. I was just going, yep. right? And I kind of in that moment with Tony realized like, wait a minute, I don't have anything to prove. I'm here to build something that I love and I'm here to enjoy, um, you know, this life that I'm choosing to live. So let the warrior take a break. (laughs) Yeah. So how did that, you know, because Tony also says that, you know, it's the moments of decision that our destiny is shaped. So how did you, in that moment, you know, you were in state, you made this decision to become a business owner, not an, op- not an operator, to, you know, find joy and fulfillment in the day to day, right, and what you were doing. How did you then turn that into action? Sure. Yeah. So I, I came back to New York and I took a hard look at my team and all of the things that we were doing. And I said, look, guys, like we need to focus. We need to de-layer um, and, and we need to really understand where we're making impact. And so uh, we were just doing a lot of things where we realized and I realized I said, look, let's do a couple things really, really well. Right. Um, an example is we have an amazing ambassador program and and those are the girls, you know, that 
we launched our company with, you know, like I said, we had a hundred girls pre-launch and then since then every month we would acquire hundreds and hundreds more, but it was a lot of work to get them. It was our team like reaching out to them and, and cultivating this relationship and so forth. And I said, look, what if we created a process where they come to us, where we create a place for them to reach out to us and so forth. And, and that's going to make your lives easier and reduce that friction. And then we can ship to them from our warehouse and still send them very unique handwritten notes and all of these things. But we can simplify the process, make it more efficient and actually make it better for the client. And, and we did that across so many verticals within our business. the team is just smiling, right? Mm, <laughs> it's just, yeah. it, 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 we, I came back with such a sense of clarity that I'm like, wait a minute, we don't need to do things the hard way. We need to look at trend lines. We need to look at impacts and then we need to create efficiencies against those impacts. Yep. That's incredible. Were that, did you have similar, because um, our audience also needs to know that you recently attended Business Mastery in Palm Beach um, in early 2018. And, um, you know, that's a, a much longer, more immersive process where you go through each area of your business. Did you have any sort of business breakthroughs there that you were then able to take back to your, to your, um, your company in, the, in a similar way and implement? Yes, yes. I would say um, probably the the biggest and most clearest was the idea of a scorecard, right? He shared a, a quote from Warren Buffett, and I'm going to mess it up, but uh, you know, you can't win if you don't know the score mm -hmm. um, type of, of logic. And um, and so I said, like, look, I can create the scorecard for the business, right? And the idea of like 10, 10, 10, right? So if if you want to have exponential growth, you don't have to have just exponential growth, you can grow um, almost like in a way that's attainable and um, mentally something that you know you can achieve by saying like, okay, I need to grow my number of customers by this percent and my repeat rate by this percent and my average order value by this percent. And by doing that across those three pillars, I will have exponential growth, mm -hmm. but it, it's not growing everything by 300%, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we were able to kind of take, um, do the math and realize like, wow, getting to our, you know, five to 10 year goal is actually not that crazy when you think about um, the actual math. But what I came back and did was say, like, forget about what that means for my total company. Let's do that by area of business. So now everybody in my company has their own scorecard and they actually report out on it every Monday. And it's super clear. And they're able to say, okay, if I'm growing email revenue, here's the three ways that I can do that towards exponential growth. And they understand the math. That's fascinating. So they have, they understand the long-term vision and the ultimate outcome, but then they have the tools that they need in order to get there in a very tangible and also very, um, very doable way. Like, very. Yeah. Great. Well, Michelle, <laughs> this has been delightful. Um, I'm sure our audience is absolutely loving just your story, your fast growth, but then, you know, the ability to sort of take a moment and reflect on what the next stage of your business is going to be and then taking action on that, um, even though it was difficult. I think this is a really fascinating story. And, and I would say I wish you the best of luck, but I, you don't need luck, girl. <laughs> <laughs> So everyone look for big things from Lively. Um, I just, I have one more question. What, what is next for you guys? Do you have some new products coming out? What should we expect um, later in this year? Sure. Yeah. It's a really exciting time for us. You know, 16 was really about, you know, can we do this? 17 was like, let's build the machine to support it. Mm -hmm. And 18 is, um, let's share with the world that we exist. And in doing so, what we've announced um, is our Lively tour, um, which is, 
our brand in real life across cities um, in the United States. And wow. every month, we're, yeah, we're going to be in a different city. We started our tour in Dallas, um, actually, and it was phenomenal. What, had, what is it? I mean, yeah, what, what, it sounds really fun, <laughs> but what is it actually? So it's, um, you know, my way of stair stepping into what I believe is the future of physical retail. Mm. Um, and so I committed our team to saying, look, our customer is all over this beautiful nation. And so we need to be, um, whether it's us physically or our brand in some way. And so what we started doing is we would go into a city like Dallas and say, all right, we're going to have three days of activations and events. Um, you know, a custom baking class, a soul cycle class, uh, an education or a happy hour. And once we get a sense from the community about what they love to experience, we're going to come back and we're going to have a two week pop up. So we were in Dallas mm. in November for the experiential test and community building. And then we came back in January and we had a two week pop up store that had events eight out of the 10 days, ranging from meditations to boss babe business panels to DIY taco night, like whatever it is. That's disco so cool. Runs. Yeah. Um, and it was just phenomenal because the girls that we met in that first community experience came back out and they ran street teams for us to let Dallas know we were there. They were holding events and podcasts. They got all of the local news stuff to, to support us. We were on Good Morning Texas. <laughs> That's and amazing. What actually happened was our digital footprint, our digital customer in Dallas grew by 200%. Our Texas consumer grew by 80%. And we actually made money in that store, which we wow. never anticipated. Yeah. Because it was all about experiences. It yeah. was about, you know, women coming in with their daughters or learning about us in their morning fitness class and bringing their whole class in to experience lively. It was just phenomenal. So actually today our team's in Nashville um, doing the same thing. And we're nice. going to Atlanta and Chicago and all these beautiful places. Wow. I love that you're custom testing each region because I think there are big regional differences. Um, they're, you're going to find some universal truths, of course, right? You're going to find some things that women all over the U.S. enjoy. Um, but at the same time, I love that you're going in and you're trying to find out what, what are the differences and how do we need to custom and tailor fit. And it's funny because that's what your product essentially is as well, you know, <laughs> tailor fit to, to match, you know, sort of the lifestyle and the preferences of, of women in that region. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And Great. we're having a hell of a lot of fun while we do it. <laughs> yeah, I can. Im I was just imagining the amount of laughter probably that took place over the, you know, that time period. It's amazing. Yeah. So yes. great. Well, it's been such a wonderful interview. Um, and we look forward to great things from you and Lively. Thank you so much. Great. I appreciate it. Of course. Hey, guys, we have a special offer for listeners of the Tony Robbins podcast. For a limited time, you can head over to www.wherelively.com and receive $10 off towards your first Lively purchase. Just enter the code VIPTONY at checkout. This offer is good until August 22nd, 2018. The Tony Robbins Podcast is directed and hosted by Tony Robbins. Anna York is our editorial director and occasional host. Our executive producer is Carrie Song. Jamie Carvajal and Adriel De La Torre are our digital editors. Special thanks to Mary Buckheit and Diane Adcock for their creative review.